Nigeria, like all the nations of the world, is navigating uncertain times. However, for Nigeria, as an all-dependent economy, this is a twin shock. COVID-19 pandemic, global and domestic shock, and oil price shock. Nigeria's vulnerabilities to the impact of these external shocks can be adduced to increased dependencies on global economics for fiscal revenues, foreign exchange inflows, physical deficit funding, and capital flows required to sustain the nation's economic activities. To discuss the long-term plans for pandemic and stabilizing systems, we have Dr. Henry Lawson from Ghana, who is a family physician, and we also have Dr. Orode Doherty from Nigeria. She is a pediatrician and public health physician. Good afternoon, doctors. Dr. Lawson, good afternoon. Dr. Doherty, if you can hear me, good afternoon to you both. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Great. It's good to have you both. Now, let's begin with you, Dr. Uh, Doherty. In spite of the relatively lower numbers in Africa as compared with Europe or the Americas, we are seeing the numbers slowly but steadily creeping up. Should this be a cause for concern? Uh, yes, I think this should be a cause for concern. Um, we're seeing the numbers creep up. This, the way we saw them creep up um, as early as February, March in the US and in Europe. So you remember initially, they too were scattering numbers of about 2,000, 3,000, 5,000. But um, this is a disease that is highly transmissible, even though it appears our numbers are creeping up slower. Um, but it, it does, we, we get into an exponential phase of, the, uh, phase of the curve, which is where we appear to be now. So if you plot the numbers in Nigeria, um, we started off sort of a very flattish curve, and now we've gone into the long arm of the J, so to speak. So it's a cause for COVID. Um, and it isn't because government isn't doing you know, as much as they can or could be doing. Um, government is working very hard. We, we can see it. Um, we don't know, however, how smart they're working. We certainly think we're not testing it. We don't have enough messaging out there, or people are hearing the message and refusing to believe it. Um, and it would appear that we're not tracking um, quite as fast enough because we're still seeing people who are coming in um, um, and, and who are dying. And so if I compare the numbers in Ghana and in Nigeria, just today we're both in the 5,000s, but we appear to have had um, five times as many deaths, or six times as many deaths in Nigeria. So right. there's something wrong with that picture. It is a cause for concern, certainly. Right. It's not a cause for alarm. We still have time to, um, to do... Um, many more things in order for us, for this not to end up with you know, hundreds of thousands of, of, of deaths and certainly not to reach them. All right. Uh, Dr. Orode, please stay there. Uh, hang in there a bit. We'll go to Dr. Harry Lawson, who's on standby in Ghana. Uh, Dr. Henry, we are just, Nigeria had taken over from Ghana, so to speak, in terms of figures. What's the situation in Ghana? We also hear, you know, this whole thing about testing uh, 10 persons at a time using one testing kit. Can you please explain that and clarify that for us also? All right. So thank you very much and hello to your viewers. Basically, we we use the method called pooling of samples. And so if you take five separate samples, we started with five. You take five separate samples, you put them all in one test kit. If the test result comes out negative with the PCR, it means that all those five samples were negative. However, if that result comes out as positive, it means one, two, three, four, five of the samples you put in will be were, were, was positive. And so we will now test all those samples individually to determine which number of the five were positive. After a while, we started getting a lot of negatives. So we, the pooling was increased from five to 10. And so we kept, we pulled 10 samples uh, at a time. Um, because we use aggressive um, enhanced constant tracing and an aggressive testing, we were doing a lot of tests. We've done over 160,000 tests. And that meant that we had to use some strategies to be able to get the test done. Because at the beginning, we had only two testing centers, one in Accra and one in Kumasi. 
and these two were handling the whole burden of testing testing those who had tested negative the double negative tests and all that over time we have expanded the testing centers to many other uh, places within the country and so that has um, helped with the uh, turnover time between the test and when you get your result so basically that is what we have done to be able to do a lot of tests in a short period of time thank mm -hmm. you all right, now, what measures are being employed that make you hopeful, particularly that, you know, you may see a peak and plateauing of the numbers in the near future for Ghana? Yeah, you know, um, in the beginning, because of the backlogs that we had, uh, you, would, you would see that results will come in two or three days, we pulled it, pulled it together and then add it to the list. From the 7th of May, the testing centers decided that they were going to clear all the backlog and then from 11th May give us daily figures. So the number of tests that become positive on each day would then be publicized for us to see. And since that happened, we are beginning to see um, a trend that is more like a flattening of the curve, but not necessarily a peak. Um, there are issues with whether there'll be a second wave and all that, and we are not testing everybody so for now we are expanding the testing from hotspots to um workplaces and all that it's a little bit difficult once you have not tested the whole country it's very difficult to say you are peaked or you are close to your peak we, we keep testing and we keep going and we keep tracking we keep tracing and all that so all those activities uh, will keep us going and it will help us have an idea of what's happening but the testing helps because once you know your status and your contacts are traced we tend to contain the disease a little better than you know if you didn't do a lot of tests all right L let's come to dr doherty here in nigeria uh, and talk about the madagascar uh, um, formulation that we received uh, dr doherty are you of the view that you know africans have underestimated our own in terms of our contribution to this global fight. What's your thought on that? So if you sort of step back and you think about just in general, Africa only contributes about 1% to the total global research output, right? So um, it's, not, it's not shocking that Africans have um, and, and continue to underestimate what it is that we can do. And so, yes, we have underestimated, but perhaps we shouldn't only think about our contribution in terms of treatment. And we look at Ghana, where Ghana pulled um, testing. We mm -hmm. think about the other um, things that we have done. So there's a global fight going on. Senegal has a test kits that can give you results in under an hour, I think it's 15 minutes. Um, Ghana has pulled testing. Um, in Nigeria, Ola Orekuri has um, come up with the booth that allows you to test without using PPE. Drive-by testing is being done at Naima. So there are a lot of things that we are doing um, that are contributing to the global fight and I really should be contributing to the Pan-African fight. We've also underestimated our capacity to collaborate and for collaboration to really make a difference. So when I think about the dashboards in various countries, we have an Africa CDC, and I, I know that they've distributed um, PPEs to all the countries. Is there more that we can do together? Mm -hmm. So I don't only want us to think about a cure, a rapid cure, a sudden cure, some herbal cure, because there is a big fight going on. It's going on across the world. And there are many components to this, and we need to be able to dot all that. We haven't even tested um, as many as they have tested in Ghana. So, you know, contributing to the fight also means bringing all of our information to bear on how every country on the African continent is fighting. Mm. So, yes, we have underestimated. Yes, there, it is with reason that we have, and we're not even yet in the, in the game yet. And we need to get the, the, the drugs that we've known for a long time. Chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, those are now being tested. And hopefully we'll start to have results. And then we can really feel about our contributions to the global
Right. Now, Dr. Lawson, against the backdrop of what uh, Dr. Doherty had said now, what specifically homegrown strategies have you seen employed so far that show evidence of progressive thinking? Well, in Ghana, we've had um, a push on the precautions. We, we've, we've harm, harmed a lot on people um, adhering to the precautions. The first one is hand washing. And we've already had uh, design, we call it the Veronica bucket, which we have, the government has asked everybody to place that bucket at every place in town. So you go to a supermarket, you go into a pharmacy shop, you're going into the market, uh, you're going to a hospital. There's a bucket with a tap with running water, soap and a towel. So you wash and clean your hands before you enter every building. That is homegrown. The second thing we've done is we needed face masks and we realized that nobody was going to give us face masks. It was difficult for us to import face masks. And so our Food and Drugs Authority came out with guidelines on how to develop face masks, the kind of fabric to use, the number of layers, the, 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 the size of it and everything. And our people started manufacturing different types of face masks, which is helping us prevent the spread of the disease. Now, I'd like to add also that this disease... Um, Actually, the recovery is based somewhat on the individual's immune status. And so there are several things that we have indigenous in terms of fruits and vegetables that can improve our immune status. And we are encouraging our people to eat well and eat properly and have a, <clears throat> excuse me, and have a balanced diet because these things will support the system as we fight the COVID-19. Mm -hmm. All right, and I come to you, Dr. Doherty. Have you seen an injection into the healthcare se sector since this pandemic began? And you know, what, what sort of deficit in terms of investment in the health uh, sector were we looking at from the onset of the pandemic? Oh, certainly. Um, so, you know, I, I live in Lagos, and um, I, one of the earliest things that happened was people um, started to come together um, so in order to support um, what was clearly going to be an overwhelming of the healthcare system in the form of providing isolation centers. Mm -hmm. And so isolation centers were put up. They are temporary large tents that have all the facilities of a, of a ward. Um, but really, they're really to get people who are infected out of circulation in order for you to reduce transmission. So that's happened by the private sector for the most part. Although in Lagos, Lagos and I think Kano and even Ogun State have converted existing buildings also um, in addition to what's being put up into isolation centers. I think same thing in Abuja. So the, the, the building up of isolation centers in order to reduce transmission by taking people who are in, um, who are infected and in circulation out of, out of um, circulation. But, you know, to your question, and, and then, of course, um, people have donated, especially large quantities, things like ventilators, because at the beginning, we thought this was a disease that was going to require the use of ventilators. Um, and we don't have those very many equipped ICUs in Nigeria. Only very few are. And many of them are actually in the private sector. They're actually small compared to the number of people. So that sort of answers the other um, half of your question, which is what, where, where did we start from? We had a very a truly decimated healthcare system. Um, and I'm not saying, I'm not the first person saying this. I think it's been said by everyone, even in authority, the ministers, and so on. We didn't have a strong primary, primary healthcare system is shot, um, it's limping along. And because of that, we haven't been able to layer on our secondary and our tertiary healthcare systems. So our tertiary healthcare systems, which is where we thought we would be really churning out the research as well as churning out the in intensive care that would be needed for those who are critically ill. Remember that people who have COVID can be symptomatic, mild, moderate, or severely ill, and then critically ill. We thought that in the tertiary centers, we would be taking care of the critically ill. And that was why there was a concern about the overwhelming of the healthcare system. So those places were not equal staffed for that matter. Yeah. And... Um, we, so we, we started off sort of very far behind, and it was necessary, therefore, to think about all the things that we needed to do, especially in the area of prevention. Like Dr. Lawson mentioned, 
you know, the prevention of COVID is the beginning of wisdom in a <laughs> situation in a healthcare system like ours, um, where the people, health literacy of the people is very poor and the healthcare system itself is not strong enough to even withstand, uh, you know, NASA fever and other infections where we can see it's coming. Okay. COVID is coming. All right, let's now round up with uh, Dr. Lawson. Uh, finally, Dr. Lawson, do you agree that the, the, the coming of COVID is the beginning of wisdom for health sectors? Does that apply also in your country? And what should we expect, you know, moving forward post-COVID? Well, I think that a lot of things will change. Um, the way we train our physicians and our nurses and our healthcare staff is going to change drastically because we used to feel some of these diseases were for other people, not for us. Now we realize that um, we had a confusion as to what we call a frontline uh, doctor or a frontline healthcare person, because all the doctors sitting in private practice were going to see the cases. It wasn't only the um, COVID treatment centers that were designated that will see uh, cases. So a, a, um, a disease that is coming that you cannot pick, there's no temperature, somebody comes and all they have is loss of taste and they don't even know they've lost their taste. It's very difficult for us to pick. So the high index of suspicion, which is required, is something that all healthcare persons would uh, look up to. And then protecting yourself when you're seeing patients is going to change drastically. In addition, um, the structure of our healthcare system and the, the infrastructure that we have and how we use it all needs to change. Our OPDs are really, really crowded, and we have to have a way of, even if we have an appointment system where people will come in, the same number of people in a day, but they are seen across uh, the, 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 the hours of the day so that there are fewer people within the hostel at each point in time. These are practical things that we can do without changing uh, a lot of infrastructure, and right. we, will, we will have... Um, very positive effects. Secondly, okay, I'm, so, I'm men, afraid that's all we can people. take, Dr. Lawson. I'm afraid that's okay, all we can sure. take. Thank you very much, Dr. Lawson Henry and Dr. Doherty Orode joining us from Nigeria and Dr. Le Henry from Ghana. Do keep safe, both of you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much.